Hi everyone. Uh, so first, just to give you a bit of a disclaimer before I start, um, this is actually uh, my CTO, uh, Brandon Phillips' talk. Uh, he was a good presenter, he put together the slides, um, but unfortunately he couldn't make it tonight, so I'm kind of filling in for him. Uh, so I'm Jonathan, I'm a, a dev developer at CoreOS, um, and we develop on, on Rock. <coughs> Alright, so um, just to give you a really quick summary of CoreOS, um, we, we're a startup, we make a bunch of different, uh, we have a bunch of different open source projects, you know, sort of the autonomous uh, operating system and then a lot of uh, distributed assistance components uh, built on top of that. Um, and we're very good users of Go, um, so probably one of the earlier um, companies to kind of go all in on, oh, sorry, thanks, to go uh, all in on Go. Um, so we have a whole bunch of open source projects um, and uh, they're basically all written in Go um, with sort of very few exceptions. Um, so generally we love Go, we've had, uh, pretty happy with that choice, uh, good experience uh, developing everything on it, you know, very fast to develop. Um, the portability is really important for us because we have a minimal sort of read-only uh, operating system, so it's really great to be able to deploy both binaries. And there's a lot of things like that, really great standard library, and uh, you know, pleasure to develop with generally. But uh, sometimes, you know, we don't have all of Go, sometimes it feels a little bit incomplete. Um, one of the areas we found it to be a little bit incomplete is uh, in RPC. Um, so, as I said, we work on a lot of distributed systems components, so we have a, a quite a bit of need to do RPC between different um, systems components that we work on. And um, this talk is just a sort of a brief tour of some of the options that we've been through, like CoreOS, and kind of just a state of the ecosystem, some of the more popular uh, RPC systems, and sort of the good and the bad, and the success that we've had. With. Uh, so first, just summarize very quickly, sort of like, what is RPC? Like, what's it about? What are we trying to do? Well, you're all Go developers, I'm sure, and you've written this great service, like let's say it's a queuing service, um, so very simple just to you know, push items off the queue, and you might have uh, workers that pull items off the queue and work on it. And you, have, uh, you want to be able to provide access to this service to, to different clients. But um, the client can be written in you know, myriad of languages. You know, ideally, everyone will be writing things in Go, have sort of first class support, but reality is that people are going to write, want to write with clients in their, in their own different languages. So Python or Ruby or uh, uh, front end internet, which is sort of uh, a new area, but um, we think it's one of the more important areas to focus on because, uh, you know, with any service uh, that you're running, ultimately you're going to have a need to kind of visualize it, inspect it, and be able to um, uh, introspect it and sort of analyze it from, from the front end. It's really powerful to be able to provide. Uh, Clients to be able to write clients that, that run in the browser. And then um, Phillips wanted to focus on uh, Node.js because he found this uh, great little uh, unofficial logo of a V8 rocket strapped to a turtle dragging JavaScript into the future. Okay, so we've got our tuning service and we've got a client that's going to write in JavaScript, but um, how are they going to interact? So, first we need them to agree on some things. Um, one of the first thing we need to agree on is uh, the verbs, so the kind of actions that the client can, can make to the service. So uh, in this example, since it's a queuing service, we're just going to have a very simple a verb that's in queue. Second thing that the client and the service need to agree on is, is the, the types of queue. So we have this verb in queue, and what do we actually uh, operate on? What is the thing I'm in queue going to look like? So you can think of this as a kind of the noun in the system. And then uh, even after we agree on those things, you know, there's still the issue of actually communicating between the client and the service. Um, so you know, what goes over the network? And the network introduces a bunch of additional considerations around things like uh, latency and error, errors, um, bandwidth. Um, and then since this particular example is a queuing service, um, we might want it to be, rather than sort of a traditional like request response style, we might want it to, to support streaming so that we can uh, stream items onto the queue or off the queue. So I want to talk uh, quickly about some sort of desirable properties that we want uh, from an RPC system. Um, first one, since this is you know, Go SF and, and we're big Go developers, we want it to be really easy to use from Go, um, sort of first class support as much as possible. Um, it should be easy to use natively in Go without necessarily you know, wrapping, wrapping different kinds of C libraries or so forth. Um, and then the next thing that's important that we've already sort of touched on is, is being able to support different kinds of clients in other languages. Um, and what we think is really, really the best way to approach this is um, client generation. Um, and I'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a minute. 
And then, as I mentioned, um, we think that web front ends are very important. So we want to be able to talk to our servers. Um, we want to be able to do RPCs to our servers from a browser. So basically from JavaScript. And then finally, um, you know, we want our service to be high performing. So we want some uh, be as efficient as possible in terms of you know, resource usage, some memory, bandwidth, latency. Um, and I'll talk about all these areas in a bit more detail. So first was ease of use. So I said that um, you know, ideally we want it to be as, as native as possible to go. Um, so you can think of um, this might be might be like your ideal uh, solution here where you're using um, native Go types to <coughs> implement a simple service, which is simply concatenating two, two arguments together. Um, so uh, we have a very simple struct that contains two strings, and then we can operate them operate on them natively in our, in our service, in our method on our, our server object, um, and that's all there is to it. And this is great because we can use you know, all, the, all the, the types that are native to Go, and we can interact with them sort of natively and, and, and naturally, but uh, the downside there is that you know, the scheme is tied very, very directly to implementation, and it doesn't really get you far for other, other um, uh, being able to sort of change the schema without having to, to constantly tweak changing the implementation. Um, so an alternative might be to say, all right, well, why don't we just use JSON for the schema? Um, this is sort of a, a so maybe a first pass of, a, of an RPC system, um, just using uh, raw JSON to encode your types and then using HTTP as the transport. And this, this is okay, but um, at, at the end when you're, um, you need to, to write the marshal sort of unmarshal code for your types manually in Go, and uh, eventually you know, this gets pretty repetitive and, and you're gonna start to need to come up with different patterns to get in, internally to try and make this less repetitive. Uh, okay. The next uh, property that we want to talk about that's sort of desirable for an RPC system um, is um, client be able to generate clients um, and interoperability with different languages. So uh, one simple solution here would be to just generate the um, type bindings using something like protobufs or JSON schema or Captain, Captain Proto. Um, but then, you know, that doesn't get you, so that, all, that, all that gets you is the schema, it doesn't really help you with, uh, with the actual transport and so forth. Um, and then an alternative solution would be just exposing the actual objects without defining that schema. Um, and that's something, you know, that you see with the native RPC uh, packages in Go. Um, and that, you know, that works fine between Go things, but it doesn't really get you far with any other kind of clients. And there's a bit of a sort of a lack of discoverability with that schema. You need to know, you know all, all the names of the objects that you can interact with in advance to be able to use them. So just to touch again on, on why client generation is important. Um, you know, everyone in this age of like web, web, web uh, APIs, everyone says they want a REST API to be able to you know, interact with your service. But actually, what they really want, they just want an API and a, and a client, like a native client library in, in the language of their choice. But you don't want to, you don't want to write and maintain that, that client library for them. So client generations um, gets, gets you that. Um, so client generation, what that looks like is, is coming up with a document that sort of describes your API um, in some standard li language. And then you have a tooling that can generate an API library in, in whatever that type of language is. And that generates the language specific implementation of the different types of methods that your API supports. And then uh, Clients can, can use the API without having to think about any of this stuff, about co encoding or transport. Everyone gets their you know, native, native uh, uh, language-specific implementation of, of the API. So a quick example of, of what that um, looks like, so the other things that buys you is the Kubernetes API, um, which uses something called Swagger, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and the really nice thing about this is that the API, once you have this document describing the API, it's completely self-describing. And you can generate all these nice things like uh, documentation pages that um, people can explore uh, to look at all the different types and the methods and, and everything that the API supports. And then as an added bonus, um, once you can uh, interact with an API directly through the browser, you can provide these cool tools to be able to uh, you know, interactively explore APIs straight from the browser. So this is an example of just um, exploring the Google Calendar API um, directly from a browser. So why is that so important? Um, sorry, how, how can we actually, uh, given that this is an ideal for us, how can we actually make this happen, this, this idea of compatibility with the front end? Well, the, diff the front end is, the difficulty with the front end is that it's difficult to move, um, you know, difficult for the browsers to sort of implement new technologies. Um, 
So, but it's very stable what's out there. So things like JSON and XML, um, HTTP and S and, and WebSockets are very well, well known, very well supported. Um, so wherever possible, we, we want to we use those technologies. Um, there are, oops, there are sort of some, some cool, tricky things like uh, implementations of protobufs and so forth in JavaScript, but they're not really, probably not worth the effort. There's a lot of compatibility issues and performance problems. So generally, striving for compatibility with front end um, pushes us more towards you know, HTTP or JSON-oriented APIs. And then fi the final property that we want in the RPC system is um, efficiency. So, uh, we want uh, you know, serialization of types to require as few memory allocations as, as possible when we're converting like, to and from the wire format. Uh, we want uh, bandwidth to be you know, absolutely minimal, so we don't want to be having to, when we're expressing, when our types are actually put onto the wire, we want to use the minimal possible amount of sort of bits to express them. And we want latency to be, like, you know, latency considerations to be dominated by the actual properties of the network itself rather than or do serialization, do serialization, or, or any client magic. So those are uh, those were the four sort of key properties that we're interested in for uh, RPC options. So I want to go over a few um, few possibilities we considered at, at CoreOS, sort of in, in, in some of the more popular ones in the Go ecosystem. So the first, as I've been talking about mostly, is um, sort of an HTTP JSON oriented thing. Um, but using, uh, rather than just using those um, sort of the raw types that I talked about, just raw JSON um, by you know, encoding it directly into the Go structs, using a, uh, using a framework like a Discovery or Swagger, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, second option would be using HTTP and, and protobuf structs. Um, I'll talk about that one too. Um, GRPC is, is, is a newer uh, option that's come out quite recently. Uh, and finally, I'll talk about uh, Cap and Proto. All right. So let's uh, try and unwrap these, this combination of technologies. Oops. Uh, HTTP JSON, hopefully you've, you've all heard of these. Um, otherwise, your know, tech career is probably pretty interesting or pretty boring. Uh, but loosely speaking here, we're using HTTP for sort of the verbs um, and JSON for to encode the types. Um, and again, I've kind of already touched on an example of that. Um, but then the, the interesting part here is, is, is uh, is the client generation. And so there's two, two kind of main options that we've explored here. Um, the first one is called Discovery, or Google's Discovery Service. Um, and this is something that, that Google develops and they use to define most of their client APIs. So the basic idea is that you write a discovery document, which is just a JSON document, and then you can, um, there's sort of bindings for a bunch of different libraries that can uh, pull down that document and uh, dynamically generate a full sort of client native to that language. So we use this for uh, for core update, which is sort of our automatic update service, and we also use it within Fleet, which is our um, distributed init system. Um, so both of those are described by uh, discovery documents, and then anyone can, can sort of download that document and generate a, a native client in you know, a language of choice, which is pretty nice. And uh, also, you know, very importantly for, for in terms of the front end compatibility, um, there's Angular JS bindings, so we can have these great web front ends that talk natively to the APIs for these services. But the Discovery JSON hasn't been very, or Discovery service hasn't been very widely adopted uh, outside of Google. Um, so it's not necessarily something we're gonna um, stick with moving forward. Um, something that seems to be catching on a lot more popular is, is Swagger, which is touting itself as sort of the world's uh, most popular up, up, uh, discovery framework. Um, and it has a, there's sort of a nice framework in a Go framework in Kubernetes for dealing with Swagger, uh, for generating and so forth. Okay, so what are the good and the, good and the bad of this, uh, this first sort of RPC uh, option, HTTP JSON and, and discovery, so, uh, discovery of Swagger? Well, HTTP and JSON are everywhere, so there's lots and lots of existing tooling and, and, and you know, debugging tools and tracing tools and so forth that you can use, and it just works. Um, there's net good native support in, in both Go and, uh, and Google Discovery, both for, for generating bindings. Um, again, first class support uh, on the front end for clients, um, and also for lots of uh, generations for clients for, for other, uh, other languages. 
But what's not so great? Well, some of the client code generation for some languages isn't really as, as performant or as nice to work with uh, as others. And then one thing that we've encountered a bit, and uh, the Kubernetes project too has encountered quite a bit, is that um, JSON encoding and you go, you know, it's okay, but it's actually pretty slow uh, by default because it uses a lot of reflection internally. Um, and I'll talk about some sort of options to kind of mitigate that a bit later on. But it does mean for that, um, you know, very performance critical uh, applications, JSON encoding, that, that overhead is definitely noticeable. And also, uh, HTTP, you know, it's, it's a pretty solid protocol, but it's not necessarily optimized for some things that we would want to optimize um, RPCs for. So, for example, uh, the streaming example earlier, if I want to stream uh, queue, events, queue events to my queuing service, um, HTTP is one is, is not really well suited for that. So another option um, I'm going to talk about a bit is using H still using HTTP as the transport, but instead of using JSON, using uh, protobufs as the uh, as the encoding uh, mechanism. And we actually use this internally for NCD, which is our uh, distributed um, key value store. So all the RPC between so NCD exposes to clients, it exposes a JSON um, API, but all the internal RPCs between the members of the of the cluster um, implementing the RAF protocol is actually um, protobuf messages going over HTTP. And um, again, that doesn't have, it's much more efficient than um, JSON as far as encoding and decoding those messages, serializing, serializing. And then the nice part about this is it allows you to, to have, since you're just posting um, an HTTP service, it allows you to have the, in theory, to sort of have the flexibility to migrate to, to alternatives um, while still using HTTP as the, the transport, alternative encoding mechanism. So some of the, the pros and cons of HTTP and protobuf. Um, again, we can use all the standard HTTP uh, debugging tools in our, in our toolkit to, to diagnose and, and sort of explore things at the transport layer. Um, then we, yeah, again, we, we have improvements in efficiency over using uh, more JSON for the serialization. Um, where it starts to become a little more awkward is, is when we're looking at you know, implementing front ends. It's, it's possible with JavaScript, but there's a lot of dependencies required, and, and again, as I mentioned earlier, it's not, not the most stable or performant. And then it's actually not that common. Um, so a lot of the marshalling stuff is kind of left to you, and the Go, the Go protobuf uh, support is not really first class. So we've had a few issues with the Go, Go protobuf library that we've needed to, to patch. Okay, uh, gRPC is a really interesting option. It's very new and came out a few few months ago, or announced a few months ago. Very shiny, um, and it's similar to HTTP in protobuf, except it's using HTTP two, the next generation of HTTP, and also using a sort of next generation of protobuf, um, proto three, I think it is. And so, since it's it's using uh, HTTP two, you get a lot of the ni these nice uh, features along with it for your transport. So. For example, you have two-point streaming, communication between the client and the server. And you could have multiple streams over a single TCP connection. So that's one of the great things. I mean, that's, that's all pretty self-evidently great about gRPC. Very efficient, very fast. Um, also, from day one, I think, there's been uh, great support across a variety of different languages, so native client generation in, in 10 languages. I will say that some of that is actually not purely native. A lot of those implementations are wrapping a C library, but the Go one is uh, native Go, which is very nice. And then, yeah, it offers, offers this, this nice property of being able to stream things uh, directly over the HTTP2 connection. Downsides are it's very young, arguably not yet proven, um, and kind of a big, can be a big one for some people is that there's, there's sort of a distinct lack of tooling yet around HTTP2. So it's a very new protocol, it's a binary protocol, so it's not nearly as easy to sort of introspect and analyze as HTTP1. Um, one issue for others is that there's no current plan for uh, browser support. Um, this is something that they, yeah, they just, not the, the GRPC developers, not something they yet plan to support. Um, no clear, not, not really a clear future there yet. Uh, another option we've elevated is Captain Proto. Um, so first I'm going to talk about its sort of native uh, RPC thing that it offers. Um, Captain Proto is, is similar to Protobuf. It was developed by, I think, one of the original Protobuf developers, um, an ex-Google. Um, and it has an interesting model with sort of interfaces and objects, which is kind of similar to the Go type system, and it's also similar to Dbus, if any of you are familiar with that model. Um, it's very efficient uh, serialization, deserialization. 
And although the, uh, I mean, the language support's not quite as, as uh, wide as you know, the other options I've talked about, it, it's improving. It's, um, there is make it go support. And it has some really interesting features like um, promise pipelining. Um, so what that looks like is that uh, rather than you know, a traditional RPC where you have this sort of uh, request response, request response, and the client can actually batch up uh, requests and um, send them to the server at the same time. Uh, so one of the big problems with that was that there's actually no Go support for the RPC part of Capital Party yet, just for the serialization side of things. Um, it's underway, but doesn't doesn't work today. So to get around that, what we could do is fall back to using HTTP as the transport for Capital Proto. Um, still using Capital Proto's serialization format. Um, it's pretty similar to HTTP and, and Protobuf itself, um, except it's a little faster. So uh, there's really not, not a lot of other sort of important difference to talk about. Um, the, the only re real reason that we chose Protobuf uh, NTD rather than Capital Proto is that we were already using protobufs for the on-disk format, so we're already quite familiar with you know, the tool chain around it and, and sort of how to use it. And so, you know, if we're evaluating this again today, we might decide to go with Cap Proto because it does offer a pretty clear uh, speed and efficiency of protobufs. So that's a bit of talk about the different options, um, but you might want to know what, sort of what the numbers are, like what are the benchmarks? Well, <laughs> <laughs> Random was working on a bunch of benchmarks for this stuff, and I sort of played around with some of the stuff, but then at some point he realized it was kind of silly because there's not really a good clear comparison between these different options. It really depends a lot on your requirements. So we can do some sort of high level um, you know, uh, theoretical uh, benchmarks, and, and what that tends to show is that um, so Gozer is, is a framework, oh, sorry, a, a, a benchmark developed by Cloudflare. And what they found was that you know, protobuf encoding is sort of three to four times faster than JSON. And then Captain Proto is maybe four to six times faster than Protobuf itself for some, uh, you know, some metrics for encoding. But really, you just need to test with your own data and you know, consult your use case depends on what you're actually doing. So, um, and then you don't want to sort of micro-optimize before you've decided what your real use case is and what it looks like for you. Um, so we have some, you know, for those of you who are interested, we, also, we have some other uh, RPC benchmarks that we kind of worked on briefly to, to compare these things. So that's a quick roundup of, of a few of four different options. Um, but what do, we, what do we actually like really want in an ideal world? What are we sort of looking for? We think that gRPC is probably the future. Um, we think it's got a lot, of, a lot going for it. Um, native Go support like from the very beginning. Um, it's building off years and years of experience of, of internal RPC systems at Google. Um, and you know, using channeling all that learning from like early incarnations of, of protobufs and from HTTP and from Speedy um, and like advances there. And you know, as, as uh, HTTP 2 becomes more widely deployed, we're going to see more and more tooling around that and being able to you know, introspect and debug and blah, blah, blah. And so it's only going to get easier to use. So one uh, sort of idea that we have here to actually um, make this happen is to use this, this cool project called GRPC Gateway. And what GRPC Gateway does is it proxies, um, it serves an HTTP JSON uh, you know, uh, REST sort of interface, and it will proxy that to native GRPC requests. So for uh, you know, newer, newer services, uh, clients that you're writing, uh, you, you can use you know, the native GRPC stuff in all these different languages that it supports, and get all the you know, awesome features that it, that it has, that HTTP2 in particular provides, for low latency, really efficient, um, you can stream, Stream, have streaming endpoints and multiplex over a single connection. And then for older clients or things that don't support um, gRPC, you can use H still use HTTP 1 and JSON um, and generate a uh, generate a, a against the gRPC spec and then provide that uh, from the gRPC gateway service. So what that looks like you know, here, um, again, all of these gRPC already has good support for a lot of languages, so Python, Ruby. Uh, Node all have uh, first class support already, so they can talk directly to your GRPC service. And then you can run this GRPC gateway um, to deal with uh, front end clients. So there are a few things, this doesn't, this isn't quite achievable today. There are a few things that um, need to be done to get us there. Um, 
One of the issues is that we can't run a GRPC server um, and a gateway on the same port, um, which makes it harder to do uh, sort of in-place upgrades from existing uh, APIs. Um, there's some sort of open issues and proposals to, to deal with that. Uh, it's not possible yet to generate um, a Swagger spec from a GRPC definition, um, but again, there's sort of some proposed, uh, proposed solutions to that. Um, I'm not actually sure what that last point means. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. So GRPC is our idea, but um, yeah, like we can't get there straight away. It's a bit of work that needs to be done. So, what are the sort of recommendations or things that we suggest in the meantime? And the first is that if you're using JSON um, in Go, there's, there's a couple of interesting options to speed it up. Um, FFJSON is, uh, I think, it uses sort of defines it, generates a bunch of types to to get around um, all the sort of reflect. Magic reflection magic that, that Go does uh, internally in the default encoding JSON thing. Um, and Ugoji's Go Codec project, uh, project does something similar. Um, we recently, someone from the Kubernetes team recently sent a patch to Go ATV, uh, replacing our use of encoding JSON with Go Codec. And we saw, um, I think, a two or a three, factor of three uh, improvement in, in, in marshalling speed, um, just switching to that codec, which was very nice. And if you're looking to the future as we are, then hopefully you can get involved and start hacking on GRPC and, and, and the gateway and kind of make it, make it um, you know, more stable and kind of test it and improve it. Or if, if you, you know, if you're like, I don't really care about this JavaScript front end thing, why does he keep talking about it? Um, then great, you know, you're pretty lucky. Um, and you can just uh, ignore that entirely and use something like CampProto or Protobuf, which is, you know, more efficient and lean, but, you know, just doesn't have that um, support in the front end. All right, and that's all I have. And uh, if you want to work, if you're interested in working on this stuff, we're hiring at CoreOS, so check out the careers page. Thanks.